And so you're looking at this passage, whole passage, whole chapter is about evangelism. Whole chapter is especially about this one person and Philip. As we're looking at this story about evangelism, about Philip, and today we want to focus more on not what you have to do, but God is the one that's doing so much, and you and I need to work together, keep in step with, work alongside, and partner with him and see what God can and will do in and through your life. You know, let's look at the first one. And that is that God is God who scatters. You know, verse 1, chapter 8, it goes like this. Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scatter throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And uh, devout men buried Stephen and they made great lamentation over him. And Saul was ravaging the church and entering the house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Verse 4, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. It starts out here, verse 1, with a very scary story. You see, chapter 6, we saw uh, Stephen preaching about, you know, Jesus. And then there were people that didn't like like him. And then after his preaching, that was recorded in chapter 7. And a guy named Saul got so fed up. And then he went to the Sanhedrin and then they dragged him out and then they murdered Stephen, and that was the first murder. And not only that, Stephen went to Sanhedrin, got the permission, and now, and then he's going to house to house, and then dragging anybody who's a believer and putting them to prison, and then he was just beginning to do uh, against any and every Christian that was in town. It was a scary fearful thing. There was persecution that took place before, but now, here it says, it arose on that day, a great persecution that affected not just few people, but everybody. And then here it says, the, all the church, all the believers had to run and had to leave their home and then had to live and then go away from that place. You know, we start with here. It's a very sad story. But then, interesting thing that we begin to see is that in the midst of great persecution, in the midst of people just having to leave everything and go, there are some other things that are hinting here. It says, as these people were scattered, throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. You know, if you remember chapter 1, verse 8, it says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And then up until chapter 6, we saw how the word of God came and then filled Jerusalem. And the next sector, next section was Judea and Samaria. And then we begin to see These people are spreading and scattering throughout Judea and Samaria. You know, what's more is, you know, as these people were going, verse 4, and they were scattered. And then as these people that were scattered, as they went about, they were not just lamenting, they were so sad, they were so upset, but they were preaching the word. And that's what we see. You see, through this scattering of people, God's word is now being scattered all over. Kind of like when the the sower scatters the sea all over different places. Now God's word, where people in Jerusalem got to hear, now through very difficult very tearful, very painful situation as people are leaving and as people are talking, word of God is now spreading to all these places. You know, what's also interesting is how it ends in verse 8. There was much joy in the city. 
There was much joy. We do not know everything, but one thing that we could begin to see is this. These people, as they were being scattered, as they were forced to be a refugee, basically that's what it was, leaving everything behind. And they were not so sad, so upset, so angry. But then as they were sharing the gospel, somehow God was at work underneath and beneath, behind all those things. And at the end, there were so many people that were rejoicing, thanking God because these people came with the gospel. And then even not just those people that were saved, but even these people that went through so much painful things who ended up at these places, they were also thankful and rejoicing. God, I really didn't like what was happening, but praise God that these people came to know Jesus, that we got to be used of God. And that's what we see. Our God is God who gathers. God gathers us to come to worship Him. And there's a joy when we come as a church to worship Him and we meet Him together. But our God is God who also scatters us as a salt and a light. Not just that you be church and God's people where you are when you come to church on Sunday, but you are sent out and scattered so that people where you are living and working together may come to know God, and that's what we see. Our God is God who is scattered. Being scattered, being dislocated and dis- displaced is never an a enjoyable thing. But nevertheless, we see that God was together. And then we see that God, even through that situation, was working, turning things turning persecution to work toward mission and furthering God's kingdom. April 9th is a a special, very important day for people of Rwanda. And then I was invited to uh, be together at a a place where they were remembering 20 years of Rwandan genocide where one tribal against another and tribal <laughs> civil war, one million people were killed. As I was there together with Pastor Jacob and sitting there in the ceremony, and there were a lot of things that I was just uh, going through my mind. And the reality of sin and evil. Yes, sin is real, evil is real. Reality of pain and suffering. A sister shared about how some of her also family members were killed and many people that she knew were murdered. But then as I was thinking also about the reality of God who is together in the midst. Did you know that our God is not just the God say, hey, time will help you, things will get better, cheer up, no. But our God is God who enters into our suffering. And Jesus who came leaving glory came into our mist and pain and then he sat together, wept together, but much more than just weeping and sitting together and then he took it upon himself, all the causes and all those things and then he went to the cross and gave his life so that and those who come to know him can have life and have hope beyond just what's happening here. You know, I couldn't help but to just thank God. Somehow, people that are in pain and going through a lot of difficult sufferings, may they come to know that you are God that know them and loves them and who is together with them, that they can find hope in Jesus Christ. And I was thinking, you know, last week, Thursday, uh, a friend of ours, you know, Dr. Jennings came and then to our office and sitting down and talking about what was happening in northern Iraq. 
And then, you know, some of our friends that was here and sharing about what God was doing in northern Iraq, you know, there he was just giving a report about what was happening. And what was happening is this. And then three guys and that came to Korea and then study here, went back to Baghdad. And then as they were going back, then his, their parents said, don't come back. And then as they were going back, and one of them said, you know, Pastor Steve, there's 70% chance that I will make it that day when I go to sleep. And there's so many bombs and so many things happening. But after a few years of being there serving and then doing the church, they were forced out and they couldn't stay anymore. And they had to run and then go to a place near Mosul and then Arvil. And then they began to just uh, find some place to stay and then live. And then in the midst of being there and together with other believers, they said, let's begin to gather believer people to worship God and they started a church and then small church began to grow and then there were so many people with the ISIS coming an hour away and then so many refugees just flooding that area they began to reach out do whatever that they can to help and then minister and then so many people coming and sleeping in the church and so many things that were happening and that I was hearing many, many, many reports. Yes, they were forced to live, but but when they turned to God and looked to God, God encouraged them and began to use them to begin to extend grace and blessing to others. Together with other believers, they are now making a huge impact, helping many other refugees. Many of you are here living in Korea. Some of you are Korean, many of you are not, and then some of you have stories like, I didn't want to ever think about coming to church, uh, coming to Korea, not church, but, but you're here. Some of you are thinking, God, so many things are out of control. What's going on? This is not what I planned and what I wanted. But you know what? Rather than fighting it, learn to surrender. Learn to turn to God because our God is God who works underneath and then behind and then turn things around in such a way. Even your tearful story, many times when you place it in God's hand, becomes stories of joy. God is God who scatters. Even if you do not understand what's going on, learn to trust him. Surrender you all to him. And second thing that we see here is this. Verse 4 and 5, it goes like this. And then now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And then Christ, the crowds with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip. And when they heard him and saw the signs that he did, and for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice and came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and so there was much joy in that city. You see, among all these people that are scattered, One example that this recorder, writer, Luke is writing, is writing about this person. In similar way how Philip has been doing this, so many other people were now sharing the gospel. Now let's think about Philip and what he did. Philip, did you know that there is a guy named Philip, part of 12 disciples? But this guy is not one of those 12. But this is one of the seven who was part of the deacons. And then did you know that he's not a Jewish, Hebraic Jew, but he's a Hellenistic Jew. So he's a guy and that used to, was probably not born in Israel, but he used to live in other places, may not speak Hebrew or Aramaic well, and then only speaks Greek. And then he came to and then Jerusalem probably during the time of Pentecost and heard the gospel and, and stayed. 
He is a second generation leader. So he was not a, a, a somebody that grew up under Jesus' ministry, but, but he learned about Jesus through the ministry of the apostles and other people. When Holy Spirit came on the Pentecost, they stuck around and then began to want to learn more and then grew over there and learning to share, learning to pray, and learning to do other things. But as he was growing and he had a burden for the gospel and other people, so he began to grow. So he was not somebody called, hey, this is an opportunity to preach, you preach. No, there were other leaders that doing it. But this occasion, the apostles all stayed and everybody's now spread and scattered. Everybody now was sharing the gospel. And now he's sent to Samaria and then it was his turn. And then he had to step up and then he had to preach about Jesus. Second generation leader. You know, something that we talked about him in chapter 6 was he was one of those people that just met the criteria of the, the deacons, had many good reputation, good repute, and full of Holy Spirit, and then full of wisdom. This man was full of Jesus. He really, really loved Jesus. And the work that he was assigned, basically he had to do uh, uh, just the mundane work of serving the table. But he proved himself to be faithful. And then he was, more than other things, an evangelist. No matter what he did, in everything that he did, he wanted to share about Jesus. Sharing about Jesus, the gospel, was the most important thing for him. You know, when we uh, recruit uh, small group leaders, in fact, we are looking for some small group leaders and and, and people that will serve on our youth ministry and the different things. And people that, what kind of people that we look for, and, and usually uh, fits this criteria uh, with our acrostic uh, fat, faithful. And somebody that's faithful with little will be faithful with much. Available. Not just able, but available. And then t- teachable. But I heard recently, it's not just fat people, but it's fat soul people. (laughs) Faithful, available, teachable, spirit-led, and obedient. But Philip was definitely one of those that fit the criteria. You know what? God could have used other people, but God used Philip here because God assigned him. This is what I want you to do. And then God sent him there. Verse 5, the word that speaks about how he was proclaiming the Christ in that city. The word proclaim is the word that describes him as a herald. When there's a two cities, two nations coming and fighting, and then what happens at the battle, which what party wins or not has such a big bearing upon the people that are staying behind. So when they have won the battle, they send a, a herald, the guy that could run the fastest, the guy that he could just get on the horse and get there as fast as quick as possible. He's a herald taking the good news. We won the battle. There is freedom and there is victory. And the guy that was assigned to bring good news to this city was Philip. Philip came and brought the good news for this city. How did he do it? He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was led there. Spirit-filled and spirit-led was important. And then what else did he do? He preached about Christ, Jesus being Christ. Important thing about our message ever is not just, oh, I was sick and then now so much better. Maybe you should pray. No, our message, the most important message about what we share is Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done. But together with a proclamation, preaching of the gospel in words, there was a proving, authentication of that message in deeds. You see, when these uh, uh, sick people were healed, and then when the evil spirit were cast out and delivered, and it was the, the signs that points to and authenticates and then proves the gospel that he was preaching was indeed 
real. And then God's forgiveness in Jesus Christ is real. And then these people are indeed becoming forgiven and becoming God's children. And sometimes you might say, oh, as long as there is a miracle that people will disbelieve me. One of the most important proof of the gospel is your changed lives. Even if you may not perform miracle of healing, but when you are able to show Jesus came and changed my life, that I do not worry because I have faith in him. And Jesus has changed me. Now, not my countenance, not just my other things. And now I have a new purpose and then sense of peace and many others. Those authenticate the gospel. And then as he was preaching this, there was much joy as people got to see Wow, God loves us. God sent his one and only son. Wow. And then verses later, they believed and were baptized. And then the Holy Spirit came upon them. What I'm saying here is this. God could have used anybody. You or Stephen and other people. As long as they come led by the Spirit, as long as anybody speaks about Jesus and has a a proof of showing that Jesus is real and the gospel is real. And then as long as the person places their faith in Jesus Christ, there is a miracle that takes place, forgiveness and Holy Spirit comes upon that person and there is no joy of salvation that takes place. You see, it doesn't matter who. Anybody. Anybody. You, too, can be used of God to bring about life-changing experiences when you make yourself available to Him. Do you remember the acrostic fat soul, <laughs> faithful, available, teachable, spirit led, obedient. God used Philip because he was available. And I hope that you continue to make yourself available to him. There's one more thing that I want to look together and think about. Our God is God who scatters even through difficulties, whatever. And then God is at work, and then bringing things, and then working, bringing all things together for good. And then we see God empowering Philip, and just like he empowers so many other people, and then bringing this good news. The third thing I want to mentioned to you from this passage is that our God is God who sends you to somebody. Sending you. Not just you to do a lot more work. Do more. Do double. But many times God is sending you for some people that he has in mind. You know, verses 26 and down speaks about and how God is sending Philip and has sent Philip to Ethiopian eunuch. And then how God sent this servant, Philip, who was in the middle of a city that is on revival. So many things are happening. God's doing powerful things. And then God tells him, get ready. I'm going to take you away from this major city where good things are happening away from where nobody is there, nothing fun, and where you have to be walking for weeks and weeks without no good food around. But that's where I want you to go. And Philip did. In verse 26, the angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. Verse 27 And he rose and went. He was obedient and he was led by spirit to go. 
And then when he went there, what am I to do? Why am I here? And then he began to see what God was doing there already. There was a man. And then, and when he went, there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch and court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And then he had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And verse 29, and the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and then heard him reading out loud the book of Isaiah the prophet and then reading about the passage that describes about the lamb and the suffering servant. And then he said, do you understand what you are reading? And uh, this eunuch said, Doi, you know, why do you think I'm reading this out loud? You want to help? Come join me. And then he asked, how can I, unless somebody guides me and explains, and he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. You see, God had one person in mind. And then God saw this one person. And in his heart, he was seeking I don't know what led him to that place, but he came to a place. I want to come to know the God of Hebrews, God of the Bible. I want to come to know the true God who is my creator. I want to come and worship him and learn more and then meet him. I want to be a believer. But because he was a eunuch, he could never become accepted to be a part of a Jew. But, but he said, he told he was a, a, a rich person, important person, a minister, fine in the country and then told the queen and said, you have to give me a long vacation because I have to go travel all the way to Jerusalem. Why? I want to go and then worship God at the temple. And that's what he did. Took many months to come to worship God. And then the only place that he could have come to was the court of the Gentiles because even if he really wanted to, I want to be a full Jew. And they would say, no, you can't now because you are an eunuch. But as he was there and as he was worshiping, You know, who is this God? How can I come to know this God more? How can I be a true worshiper? And then he heard about Messiah and other things, and then he purchased a scroll, huge scroll of Isaiah, where it has a prophecy about the coming Messiah. And there he was. He was reading it. You see, God saw his heart. And then God was already at work. And it so happened. He was reading a section where we were speaking about how even the eunuchs will now become part of God's kingdom. And then now the Messiah that has come, and then he's going to die a substitutionary death, and there will be a forgiveness, and then God's new kingdom, and that will take place. And then as he was reading those sections... It just happened that God brought Philip at that time. And then God said, go and ask. You know what? When he explained, this is the Messiah that Isaiah was prophesying. The Old Testament was prophesying. But this person came. He is Jesus Christ. He came and lived a perfect life and he died, our substitute, so that you can be forgiven in Jesus Christ and accepting him. You now can become a child of God. And then when the gospel was explained, and this gentleman says, what's keeping me? You know, it was my being a eunuch that kept me from wanting to come and worship? What's keeping me from being baptized when Jesus came and died for a eunuch like me? And there he accepted Jesus Christ, was baptized, and he went his way rejoicing. 
because that's what gospel does. You know, many times when Spirit leads us and then He sends us to people, that God is so in love with and then he has in mind for many until you say, oh, have you ever thought about heaven and then hell or God or issues of our spiritual life? And then many times we are surprised to see that many people are curious and open. There are many seekers. We see in Middle East, a lot of these people praying to Allah end up seeing and God in dream and then God leads in that way. But in book of Acts, in the story of Cornelius that we're going to look at next Sunday, but in the story of this Ethiopian eunuch and to the people that are seeking, God is sending his people and servant to God. So that it will not just be a dream. So that it will not just be an information. It will be the words. But it will be a living proof with your life. And so that they can come to know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Philip went and saw that God was already at work. Who has God sent you to for? You know, uh, I use public prote- uh, transportation. You know, often I live not too far from here. But, but anyway, and sometimes early in the morning when I come to church, I use taxi, and it's uh, readily available. And uh, one time I got on the, the taxi and you're home coming to church, and uh, this person and said, where are you going? He said, would you take me to uh, Onuri Church? And that's here. And in the midst of a few conversations, he says, I don't like Onuri Church. I said, what? What's going on? He says, the guy that goes to Onuri Church, he's a deacon, and then he cheated me, and then did wrong to me, and then I don't like Onuri Church. He says, I'm sorry. But I said, do you go to church? And he says, he doesn't, his wife does, but he doesn't, he doesn't like church people. And basically that's what he said. And so I came to church and said, thank you. And then I said, bye. And a few weeks later, I got on the taxi. It was the same driver. <laughs> it was the same driver. And so where are you going? To church. Okay, Onuri Church. Yes, I told you I don't like Onuri Church and the guy that used to, you know, go there. And then we were talking. He said, hey, you know, what did you do? He's a retired person. He says, I used to work at the base. Oh, what did you do? You must speak English well. And then he was just talking about uh, different things. And then I got to the church and thank you. And he says, oh, have a good day. And then a few weeks later, I got on the taxi. It was the same gentleman. And said, hi, how are you? And then I was talking more about what's going on. Tell me about your family. He has a wife and he has two sons. And one of them lives in, in Canada together with two kids. And then we were talking about different things. And he says, my son is not doing so well in different things. And then he says, you're a pastor, right? Yes. Why don't you pray for my son? I says, okay. Okay. And then a few weeks later, I got on the taxi. And then it was him again. And then we were talking about different things. And then that day, what ended up happening was I ended up you know, parking the car and I ended up just praying for him together with him. A few weeks later, I got on the taxi at another time. It was right before coming to our 4 o'clock service. And then he looked at me and said, Hey, Pastor, I went to 11.30 service. Which service are you going to? I said, I am going to 4 o'clock service. And he said he went to church together with, with his wife. A couple more weeks later, I met this guy again. And this time, as I was getting on, he was saying, how are you? How are things going at church? And I was talking about different things. And then he had Christian radio on. And then he was telling me a little bit about his church. 
one more time. I got on the taxi. There I met him. He was talking about some other things, health issues and other things. And then when he came here, pray for me. I said, okay, let's pray. So I was praying for him again. And then, of course, he always keeps the meter running. (laughs) And then when we were all done, he said, thank you, have a good day. And I was so blessed. You know, from the second time or third time I was meeting this man, doy, you know, it didn't take much for me to figure this out. Must have been his wife that's been praying for this man for long. And God just so happened to push me, you go and be together with him and serve him. And God sent me to him. You know, at our church, I talk about bless. One of the ways that you can be a missionary using this acrostic, bless. Begin with prayer, listen to people, eat together with people, and serve, and then share your story. I hope that you will learn to incorporate this into your life. How do I serve God? How do I witness to people? Use this acrostic bless. Take time even later to think about, prayerfully think about who it is that God has sent you to for. There may be some people, two or three people, that God placed on your heart and so that you will put these people on this blessed list. But as you start desiring to bless them, begin with prayer. Regularly pray that God will prepare his heart or her heart. Regularly pray that God will give you thoughts and ways that you can love this person with God's love. And then, L, listen. Ask question. Ask the Holy Spirit, but ask what's going on in his life. And ask and see about the needs and what you can do to help. Eat. Do something, coffee together, eat together, so that you could build a relationship together. And then serve. Find ways that you can, in a genuine and practical way, to show God's love. And then as share the story about how Jesus changed your life and who Jesus is, so that your friend, the people that God has sent you to, will come to hear the gospel so that there may be much rejoicing in his life as well. Peter Chai came last Sunday and he preached and then during the week I had a chance to talk together with him and then we're talking about different things and he said steve you know let me tell you about a little bit about playing improvisation especially jazz improvisation he said he went to a conference and then there were four people came and then they were just playing music different jazz music and right before and playing another music he said you know we have four people here and then we are going to play a piece that we never played And everybody like, you never practice, never play. No, this is the new thing that we never play. And people are wondering, how does it work? And how this is a jazz improvisation? And how do this thing work? And then this leader talked about two things. This is what's going on. And one, you need to relax. You have to have a relaxed awareness. You need to relax that you're not going to mess up. You don't have to do perfectly relax when you relax that you're not going to mess things up. And then when you know that you begin to hear and then you could hear what other people are playing better and so that you can engage better. Relax. Relax. When you're thinking about blessing other people that It's not you that's going to mess things up. God's in control. And then also, there are two things that these people have to do. They have to know the tradition, the thing that they have to play, the the jazz thing. And they they have to know how to do things. And then they have to be willing to try something new. You know, if people just know what to do, set things, and that's easy, 
But, but it's not just those. Or if people always want to try new things, that's easy, but they need to do both. So in a way, what's going on is as they begin to play together with the piano that started and then the bass came and then saxophone and then, and then there was a drum that came and they were making this music, melody and harmony that we were playing and was a wonderful music. In a similar way, when God invites you, trust me, I'm going to use you to hit a home run. Don't worry about 90%. failure rate. Don't worry that you never want anybody to cry. Don't worry, relax. I'm in control. But you need to know certain basics about preparing your heart and surrendering your life to Christ, about who Jesus is, and about what you need to tell people how they can repent and accept Jesus Christ and become a part of God's child. You need to know some of these things, but then let the music happen and just play. You know, let just click. And I hope that you and I will be willing to let God use you and hit some home runs. Home runs, not the way you used to think, I can't do this, but relax. God is in control. Know who Jesus is. Know the bless. And then give it a try. Give it a try and let God surprise you. Let us pray.